Welcome to Web3 with A6 and Z, a show about building the next generation of the internet from the team at A6 and Z Crypto. That includes me, your host, Sonal Choksi. This show is for anyone seeking to understand and go deeper on all things crypto and Web3, whether you're a developer, creator, or other builder. So in this week's episode, we do a wide-ranging, deep dive on all things metaverse. What it is, what it isn't, how VR or virtual reality, video games, sports, brands, and communities play out here. We also go into where crypto comes in here, including discussing trends in DAOs, on-chain gaming, themes like interoperability, composability, etc. And we also go well beyond technology and into science fiction, the arts, low fidelity design, narrative, and more. Our special guest is Herman Nurilla, author of the new book, Just Out, Virtual Society, The Metaverse and the New Frontiers of Human Experience. He is also the CEO and co-founder of Improbable, a London-based virtual world infrastructure company born out of Cambridge University, which is where Nerula got his degree in computer science. And also joining the conversation is Elena Berger, deal partner on A6 and Z Crypto, where she focuses on games, NFTs, Web3 media, infrastructure, and more. She also published, after this conversation took place, a review of Herman's book and broader themes, which you can find at a 6 zcryptocom As a reminder, none of the following is investment, business, legal, or tax advice. Please see a6nc.com slash disclosures for more important information, including a link to a list of our investments. Anyway, our How We Sell conversation winds backwards and forwards from past to present to future, but we begin by tackling the topic of VR, immersion, and more before going into the nuances of metaverse. VR is a really tricky thing because it demos really well to people who've never played video games. And it can even feel like the future because it feels more grown up than what your kids are doing on their console or on their phone. And you look at Find Minecraft or Fortnite or Roblox, they're all simplistic graphically relative to games from five, 10 years ago. And that's intentional and related to their wide appeal and their accessibility. But you can see this like fancy VR demo and you're like, well, hang on a second. This is different. This is more grown up. This is more mature. And I think for a lot of companies that in any case wanted to see interactive entertainment and virtual environments as a next step, VR has acted as a psychological catalyst for them to feel like the tools now exist, even though I don't think that tool is all that important or that useful for them. I think the actual reason people are doing it is more gimmicky. Yeah, you go immersion, but it actually doesn't feel real or satisfying for some reason. Or you go kludgy graphics, but it's so immersive and you get, you know, really, really personally yeah. invested. So there's these two incredible examples of very, very early games or MMOs in Herman's book. And they're kind of put up against each other in opposition. And I think that we're still seeing that today. One is called Battletech, which is sort of a VR experience that popped up at suburban malls throughout America. And Battletech was hailed as the first real immersive VR game. But in reality, just the graphics were bad. The feeling wasn't very immersive. And it just didn't catch on as much as people thought it was going to. Now, there's this other game called Habitat. And I was totally nerd sniped on Habitat. <laughs> and this was like in 1986, 87. But basically, it was this game that you could access on a Commodore 64. So like an old computer made in the 80s. And you needed a Quantum Link subscription to access it. And Quantum Link was a kind of early version of AOL. But the game itself was a multiplayer virtual civilization. You could pick an avatar. You had your own home. There were like 20,000 regions and there was in-game trading and commerce. There were items you can interact with. And then the game got more complicated as more people joined. And the engineers behind the game have this really, really amazing postmortem where they talk about the debate that went into whether or not you could have murder and crime in the game. Oh, fascinating. And apparently there was like a 50-50 split. It's a community of like 
20,000 people. And eventually they decided that you could have murder, but it would only be in like the forest wilderness region of the game. So you couldn't have murder in the town square, but you could like take somebody out into the woods and kill them and take their entire inventory. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. But what's really interesting about this game, and Herman, you talk about this in your book, is the level of user creativity and Mm -hmm. also user interaction. Like there was a chat system and you could talk to people. Let's be really clear on terms because I think you did an amazing job of explaining, but a lot of people listening may never have heard of either of those games. These similar examples so people are aware. Think of the difference in playing a Dungeons and Dragons campaign if you've ever played a game with your friends where you could create these incredible worlds with incredible detail and richness. They're all played on paper, but because you're all telling the story and reacting in real time to what happens. You can make the world very rich versus the best Pixar movie you've ever seen, right? So to build on Elena's point, immersion and presence are two different words for the value of a virtual experience. And immersion means that the world feels real in the sense Mm -hmm. it's realistic. Presence means that the world thinks you are real. So you can take a lot of different actions within the world. And I think they generally end up trading off against each other because of content costs. I want to go back to this distinction, but I want to ask you guys a very simple question, which is, let's just define metaverse, what it is, what it isn't. And I want to hear your definition, Herman, from your book. Elena, I want to hear your definition. And then I highlighted about four or five key phrases in the book. And I want to quickly probe you on some of those too. So I'm going to give a very high level what I think the market defines it as. And I think the first thing that comes to mind when people think of what is metaverse is simply VR in the form of a virtual world, not just VR, the device that gives you access to the virtual world, which has like a lot of content and some abilities to kind of move between spaces. And honestly, the canonical example that comes to mind would be something very Ready Player One-ish, where there's this completely kind of single view of what that world is that you immerse yourself in. You go into it, that you actually kind of leave your physical world reality And that's what people think about when they come to Metaverse. Tell me if I miss anything crucial, but that's what, with my former media hat on, I think that's what people really think of when they think of Metaverse. I think that's what people think it is. And that's the definition journalists and companies are working towards or attacking or getting confused about. Okay, so that's the baseline. So then, Herman, how do you define it? And also, people are very confused about whether games are Metaverses. Well, stop by saying, like, why is it important to define it well. Some people are like, oh, it doesn't matter. We don't even need this word. Well, of course we do. Because how do we decide how to allocate capital? How to measure a TAM? How to know if the effort entrepreneurs and individuals are placing are good or bad or valuable or not valuable? My main issue with the broad definition is this is not very useful. It could describe lots of things. A dream, any kind of embodied experience, an acid trip, you know, a video game, all of these things have similar properties. And I think if we fall into the trap of the metaverse is anything, Disney Plus is the metaverse, video games are the metaverse, everything gets very confused. You can address it with both smart TVs and video games and crypto, and it stops meaning anything, right? What makes the metaverse interesting is not that it contains differentiated experiences. Those are already happening and have happened in our lives. It's that those experiences are linked. The interesting thing about the metaverse is that it's a network of meaning, of the transfer of value through identity, objects, and things between these worlds. And once you establish that, you realize that a lot of virtual experiences are not suitable for a metaverse because the economics or practicalities of moving value from one world to another don't make sense. And once you think about it as a network of meaning, especially a network of meaning that relates multiple socially constructed realities together, you also start to see that the concept can be bigger than technology, broad enough to encompass sport and the real world, because these represent networks of meaning. So for me, the definition is a network that supports multiple worlds where value is exchanged between them. Some video games could be the basis for a metaverse, but not all video games with that definition. That's fantastic. Just to close this loop, Elena, what is your definition of the metaverse? I think a metaverse is a society or virtual civilization in which people immutably own their assets. And I think a metaverse is a virtual environment in which people's actions and ownership is enshrined immutably, likely by a blockchain, crypto, and the metaverse go hand in hand. And it's one in which people feel ownership over the society that they inhabit. And this does occur digitally and it does occur virtually. I am still thinking through the degree to which what does physical embodiment look and feel like in a metaverse? I think we're seeing 
early examples of that? Your definition and my definition are a lot more similar than listeners might imagine. So we're talking about a network of meaningful events, people and things that everyone can agree upon. And you're introducing another idea, which I like so much, I'm going to steal it for future definitions. But (laughs) we're introducing the idea that people as a group have to agree upon the history of those things. And in my book, I talk about an ancient metaverse and talk about the battle of the eclipse between these two Greek factions that hated each other. And they had to agree that the eclipse meant that they could stop fighting. It was like a deal they subtly made with each other, right? That all the gods want us to stop. So this idea of having an agreed history or an agreed network is vital to building meaningful experiences. And I think what your definition does really well is highlight that the difference between the experiences that are relevant to a metaverse and experiences that are just by yourself or pure entertainment or in a dream or in a small game is the impact they have. And you cited ownership. And for me, I call that the chain of consequences of those actions, right? And this is why I think when people conflate the video games industry and the metaverse, they do both a disservice. Interesting. Let's talk more about that because when Elena said ownership and you said it's like kind of connected to people's agency, one of the things in your book that I thought was really powerful is you described the impact of a world where you can have cause and effect, whether it's at a user level or like agents or actions in that world. And the other idea that I think is really interesting there is it's very active and interactive versus passive, which is how people currently consume a lot of games and TV and other, quote, entertainment. So do say more about that, Herman, because I think this will actually sharpen the definition a bit more. So let's take an example, a very real world one. We can support 30,000 people talking at the same time. 30,000 people speaking at once in a physical space where everyone's voices operate in a physicalized way. So you'll hear a person singing, you know, bouncing off the walls from the crowd on the other side of the stadium. If it was in a stadium, you could hear people close to you louder and people further away quieter. And we can introduce all sorts of tricks. Now, that's a really dumb feature for a video game. Like that's an awful feature for a video game. Which game needs 30,000 people talking at the same time, right? Nobody needs it. Yeah, even 20 is too many, but yeah. Even 20 is too many, right? However, it's a vital feature if your goal is to let an Indian cricket fan experience being at a cricket match for the first time on their phone. Or your goal is to come to a fashion show in Paris Fashion Week with thousands of VIPs from around the world. Because the idea of them speaking and you hearing what they're saying, even if you, you know, don't care, the knowledge that there are real people over there that are speaking, and the fact that you, know, you might start a joke that causes a laugh or whatever, the possibility of that is vitally important for the space having presence and meaning. Otherwise, it is just passive consumption. And the psychology of experiences is very, very clear. You have to have the ability to interact and to make changes and for those changes to matter for the world to provide you with any fulfillment. So Facebook wants to put people in VR headsets in a Zoom meeting. That just feels pointless to me. It feels pointless on every level. You need to have this notion of meaningful experiences. And that's what separates traditional video games from the metaverse. You've mentioned the word meaning a couple of times as part of your definition, you know, like networks of meaning, finding meaning, et cetera. I want you to actually define what you mean by that. No, sure. I think if you look at the history of the early internet, there's this transformation in communication and narratives and media where companies and people realize data, information can be a tangible and valuable thing separate from physical goods and services. Wow. You know, huge companies got created that did nothing but move bits around and did that in a way that facilitated communication. The epochal change now is to go beyond that and go, you know what? This information, this can represent not only physical goods and services and and intangible things like messages from your friends, but we can take the intangible world of how we spend our time and our money, the intangible world of brands, of ideas, of experiences, of events, of clout, and we can turn that intangible world into a tangible, tradable one. We're pretty good at understanding how to assign value to these intangible things to some extent, maybe not accurately, but a more interesting problem is Why does an immaterial token have value? Isn't that interesting a question when you look at an economy in which you have a trillion dollars in fashion globally or whatever the number is, right? You know, there's so many immaterial and made up things in a society with pyramids and cathedrals and sneakers that are worth a thousand dollars and celebrity that we already have and ascribe value to, where meaning itself, meaningful things, meaningful relationships, meaningful objects, meaningful experiences can get quantified and turned into digital assets. And those digital assets can then be the basis of an entirely new economy. I call that the fulfillment economy. 
and economy focused on psychological fulfillment because we're trading experiences and intangible things. That is what I mean by meaning. It's like the next layer of societal value on which we can build an economy. That's funny because the minute you said that, the first thing that came to my mind was NFTs, like non-fungible tokens, because obviously there's so many use cases for NFTs more broadly. But for me, the reason I engage in NFTs is meaning. The idea that you are essentially capturing parts of your identity, who you want to be, who you are, the communities you belong to, kind of modern religion. I mean, it's just so many different ways to think about it. Mm -hmm. I think we should draw a distinction between one implementation of uh, digital assets, which is an NFT and an NFT itself. But I'm going to just use the word NFT to mean all kinds of digital assets because I think it's the best representation we have right now of what it would be. But I think the idea of like a thing which exists in a protected context outside of any one world controlled by anybody, is incredibly valuable. It means that I can trust it. I can rely upon it. I can use it in ways I wouldn't otherwise use. I have an incredible magic item in Neverwinter Nights on one specific server of a game. It's a really old magic item. It's really powerful. I doubt anyone listening cares. Only a thousand people, (laughs) you know, play that. It's a mod of a game of a thing. I can never show it to you. I can never take it out. I don't even think I still have the game installed. So it's kind of gone. But if that item was something I could own, or if any of the time I spent, you know, winning in Halo could have translated into an heirloom or an item, that would mean a lot to me. And even if I couldn't use it in a particular game or world, in a very minimal scenario... It's still like a medal, right? It's like something you won or you had or a memento or a picture or something you got from holiday. We forget that we just can't do that right now with our digital experiences. We really can't. We have no means of making that happen. And then often we're even banned in the terms of service or in the IP from even describing, interacting or talking about these things, right? Which is a horrible situation for people whose you know lives are meaningfully impacted by virtual worlds. I spent probably a thousand hours playing one or the other of those games. That's a ridiculous amount of time to spend and have nothing to show for it. You know, I I probably spend as much time as you would need to get a pilot's license or something and have nothing to show for it. So NFTs are like a vital building block of meaning within this network or this world. Totally. I'm going to probe on one more thing. Please probe. Probe away. Okay. So you mentioned the word experiences. That's kind of a generic word. It can mean just about anything. And one of the arguments you make is that immersion with that experience is almost like pointless in defining a metaverse. Like you need immersion with experience. Can you say more about what you mean by experience? Because I think this connects to the whole finding meaning in the fulfillment economy. Well, in the end, like the unit of value here is I have a cool experience. Maybe I kill a dragon or make a new friend or I go to a concert. But it's those experiences which are why we care about any of this to begin with, right? It's the reason why we're engaging in the entire pageantry of interacting online or why we care about owning something because it must relate to some context. Maybe it just has monetary value, but in a game, certainly the reason people care about the objects they own is because of the relevance they have to the world. So experiences are the functional unit of how value is created in the metaverse. And every question needs to be about what new experiences someone is making and therefore how they will actually be used, why and how that connects to the idea of the business model and digital assets of the most likely model that that's going to be, and how that experience relates to experiences owned and operated by other companies, entities, or creatives. And I think if you look at those three dimensions, you can start to build a picture of the economics of the metaverse. So one question then, because I was very confused by this then, when you argued in your book that you don't think Disney World is like a metaverse, essentially, why would you say that? Because to most people listening, it probably seems like an immersive world. There's a lot of experiences. You know, there's a lot of meaning, fulfillment. People get engaged, married at Disneyland. You know, they do dates there. It's like people don't realize how popular Disneyland and Disney World is for adults, not just children. I don't recall the specific place where I actually made that argument. But I would say that if you look at Disneyland in isolation, no, it's not a metaverse because it's only one environment in which experiences happen. But in your justification for why it is a metaverse, you introduce the second context, which is all of these presumed real world relationships. Like if somebody's getting married at Disneyland, then that's an interface of two completely different realities, right? That's not a Disneyland thing. That's a them getting married thing. I think if you are having a consumptive experience where Disneyland is not changed by me having been there, I go there, I leave. Yes. It doesn't matter. That's not a world I inhabited. That's just a movie I saw, right? That's right. But when you introduce all of these things that have changed, so the relationships of people like I got married, whatever, You need another world to store that context, in this case, the real world. And yes, then the relationship between Disneyland and the real world is much more metaverse-like than that between 
many video games in the real world. Why? Because there's a lot more interoperability and interaction, right? Because it's in the real world. You can get married there. You can do stuff there. It's a bit weirder to get married inside a proprietary platform video game, although it has happened. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. This goes back to your earlier point about cause and effect. So Disneyland right now is effect without cause. Like people can't, like you said, exert actions on that world and sort of change things. That also highlights the danger and the opportunity. If a bunch of people who make consumptive one-way media, even games which are linear or which are lobby-based games where it doesn't matter what happens, if those people suddenly want to get into the metaverse business, they have to be comfortable with what they have created going beyond their control. And this is where I think Web3 companies have an edge. Mm -hmm. Like if people suddenly start gold trading in WoW, WoW can shut that down. But if people start gold trading on a game based in crypto, WoW can't shut that down, right? That's essentially something that they've signed up to by making the game part of an open, interoperable system. So all of the metaverse growth we've seen, it's all from non-gaming companies who want to interoperate with each other because they like the idea of you taking your handbag from a baseball match into a movie premiere. Games companies don't like the notion of interoperability. Yeah, Herman, I'm so glad you used the word interoperability. I think what we're really seeing early signs of now is the crypto ethos or crypto value of interoperability. The idea of taking one asset in one context and being able to use it in a completely different context is really pushing developers, both within crypto and outside of crypto, to think about how you can generate and sustain and augment value way beyond its original context or original use case. And there are a couple of examples that you could point to in the world of crypto, just from a basic starting point, you know, with some caveats around file formats and how you actually represent an asset, I can take an NFT in one environment and have it be read in another environment. And there are other cool things that we've seen around composability and interoperability in early crypto games. Just to give a brief history of composability and interoperability just in crypto games, one that I really like to point to is actually CryptoKitties. It's one of the first crypto games. In fact, it's so basic and simple that the gameplay mechanics were sort of overpowered by just the fact that people were minting NFTs and getting excited about NFTs for the first time. But there was also a gameplay mechanic, which is you would take two crypto kitties and you would breed them. And then the resulting crypto kitty could be more rare or less rare. There was also sort of a judgment to be made about the value of subsequent generations of crypto kitties, who was an OG. Funnily, a lot of these kinds of questions and value judgments are still made today in the crypto space. But the important thing about crypto kitties is that when it was on Ethereum, a majority of the really important gameplay mechanics were on chain. And One of them was actually the function to give birth to your cat. So theoretically, after you mated your two cats, you would wait 40 minutes and then your baby crypto kitty would be born. Now, on Ethereum, you can't actually say, you know, 40 minutes from now, execute this function. Somebody else actually has to call a function. So... Within the architecture of CryptoKitties and within their smart contracts, they would actually give a reward to somebody who called the give birth function to give you your resulting cat. And whoever called that function would get a piece of the CryptoKitty give birth fee that a user would pay to breed their two cats, which meant that all of a sudden you got this small ecosystem of bot operators who would scan the Ethereum mempool looking for people calling this function in order to get a piece of that fee in time. And there was a developer who at one point when this game was really popular was making, I think like one or $200 an hour just because he was running a bot that responded to this function being called. 
And then also within CryptoKitties, there were other marketplaces built on top of it. Somebody built a tool that actually allowed you to see a cat's attributes before it was actually rendered on screen. And that allowed people to buy more rare CryptoKitties before other people. There was just this really robust ecosystem of early Ethereum developers who were super excited about new kinds of gameplay mechanics that could be done because so much of the important data and so much of the important information about gameplay was on chain. And yeah, going back to this idea of like interoperability and this idea that an asset that lives in one context in one game can mean something very, very different in another context in another game. You can have an asset in one universe that then can mean something very, very different in another universe or you have an asset that has value in one universe and you just want it to persist with that value into another universe, which is also totally valid. That is something that we just have not seen in the digital world of games and immersive experiences yet. And it's something that I think crypto and other platforms can definitely be a big enabler of. I love that as a great history of crypto gaming and also highlighting the unique component here, which is taking something from one context to another. Crypto lets us agree upon who owns what, and it lets us agree upon sort of contextless data about that object. The moment the object starts existing in a complex video game, then that does not suffice. There's a lot more information we need to know in order to allow users to usefully use that asset and move that asset between worlds, which requires more agreement and more structure than crypto gives us, which is too expressive, or which a game engine gives us, which is too limiting. So in order for the metaverse to really happen, you do need this middle layer of agreed upon services, standards, and pieces Mm -hmm. that bridge value between worlds, like a layer on top of the blockchain, rather than being something that one party could control without destroying all of the value. One of the other things is I think you can do a lot more unbundling and bundling of identity through NFTs across these worlds. If you think about NFTs, like one thing that we're limited by in our current identities or even gaming avatars is how limited they are. I totally agree. I think people forget also some of the problems. Like, Everyone's assuming that you can just render all these NFTs on screen. Maybe surprise people to learn that most video games can only render about 50 characters that look Mm, different. mm -hmm. Didn't matter for video games, but it absolutely matters when you start thinking about these types of experiences. It's funny because it's an essential component and everyone just assumes that that problem will get solved. There's a lot of that like wishful thinking with metaverse companies right now where they're describing this amazing end state and then brushing over nine or 10 like critical technology problems. Yeah, for sure. I think something that's interesting to chart is that NFTs and assets that exist on that system only have value ascribed to them because the system that they're built on is permissionless and that you can extend outward from them. And NFTs, aside from being just extremely interesting and such a fascinating design space, because you have immutable ownership, because you can see, you know, who else owns an NFT and in doing so get a sense of community or be able to marshal or rally community in that way. It is an invitation to build and extend outward from that core unit. And it it becomes like this rapidly materializing world, like a world that's being animated or drawn by multiple people in real time and everybody gets to fill in the scaffolds together. So to me, NFTs are an invitation to do that. Exactly. This actually could be a good segue to talk about emergent metaverses or examples of things that could become metaverses by my definition. Go for it. I think NounsDAO is very, very interesting. For those who don't know, NounsDAO is an NFT project on Ethereum. DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And what they do is every single day, they have an auction for a noun NFT. And a noun, it has various attributes that live on chain. The noun has always a characteristic set of glasses. Every day, the head and the body and the various attributes and the colors are different. 
different. Some days the head looks like a skull. Some days the head looks like a moose. Some days the head looks like a pineapple. And so basically nouns, they're an NFT. They're released every day. What's interesting about them is when you buy an NFT, you become basically a member of the nouns community. And what that means is that there are proposals that are brought to the nouns. And the treasury right now has around 30,000 ETH in it, which is about $40 million in USD. Using the treasury that the community has amassed through the sale of these NFTs, the DAO then gets to decide how they want to use their proceeds. So there have been, I think, nearly 150 proposals so far. Some have been successful. Some have haven't been successful. The proposals are completely varied in terms of what they do. Some of the proposals are to create a clothing brand for nouns or to create glasses, like real world glasses for nouns or to have a nouns presence at New York Fashion Week. Some of the proposals are things that exist digitally, but are like meant to extend the ecosystem in some way. So a recent one that I really liked was somebody basically just came to the DAO and said, what would nouns sound like? I'm going to create this on-chain module of sounds and allow people to create sounds from that. And in addition to the core nouns DAO, there are all kinds of sub DAOs. So there are little nouns, there are nounlets, there is the nouns prop house, which allows other NFTs to have proposals brought to them as well. It's become this far ranging community built around NFTs. I'm not sure if metaverse is quite the right word because I don't want to dilute the physical feeling of presence and embodiment. And because so much of nouns exists in discourse and on Discord, it's hard. Like, is it a metaverse? Is it not a metaverse? I'm not sure. But what I think is really fascinating about nouns is that Proliferating it and extending the meme of nouns needs to occur not only in the digital world, but in the physical world. Yes, the community is built online. Yes, their treasury is denominated in internet money and ETH. But you can use and spend that money in the quote-unquote real world, in the physical world as well. And I think that the metaverse in whatever form it takes will need to have this sense of permeability between the virtual world and the physical world. I agree strongly that you don't need embodied experiences that are separate or even in the physical world for something to be a metaverse. You do need all the things I didn't mention, like you need this system of meaning and a system of rules that lets new things get created. But the experiences which kind of make up participation in the metaverse, they can happen anywhere. I mean, they could happen in the real world. So this is why I'm so against the the sort of industry standard definition of the metaverse as being about 3D embodied experiences, because A, it cuts out a whole bunch of experiences. And secondly, it unnecessarily puts the focus on the experience and not on the consequences of that experience and the system and environment in which those experiences are happening. That's the new thing. The metaverse is a new context for people to buy and sell things, have experiences and do stuff. What's interesting about that context is not that it's a 3D avatar driven environment. It's Mm -hmm. that it's a context in which in an entirely digital way, meaningful experiences can happen. And there's a lot of plumbing and build up to make that possible. And this is where crypto communities are a great example because they have the meaning right now. They already have systems where meaning can be traded, can be interacted and can be interoperated. They don't necessarily have compelling experiences yet, which are important, but they do have that first part. Right. And I would just note from your book, two phrases that really struck me is you had this phrase that it's not an alternative reality, but more reality. And you also had another phrase when you were just talking about this idea that the metaverse is not about escapism or entertainment, but about so much more. And I do think those are phrases in your book that are relevant to this part of the conversation that Elena just brought up, because I think that ties as well to the connection between 
the digital and the physical. By the way, it connects even to the early use cases with NFTs and real world unlocking experiences as well, which is another side thing. And also bringing it full circle. This idea that it's a place you leave and go into is precisely what is very isolating about the metaverse in the current definition than this thing that can be, as you say, networks of meaning that are connected and that those networks of meaning can be connected to the physical world, which is Elena's points about this feedback loop between digital and physical as well. You're absolutely right. Kind of takes me to, I think this was Harold Pinter, I can't remember who it was, who defined a piece of theater as being like, someone does something and somebody else watches. And like, uh, yeah. it was a really simple definition, but the watcher had to be there. Otherwise it wasn't theater, right? Yes, that's very similar to like Sol LeWitt and art and this idea that the art, I'm forgetting who right now, but who said the art does not exist without the viewer completing it. Yeah. And sort of essentially being a part of that. You're completely right. We actually, I was thinking about the playwright Bertolt Brecht a couple nights ago. And this like very Brechtian idea of denying your audience catharsis. So in like Greek plays and in trad plays, a play will have a nice happy ending and, you know, justice will be served and people will learn a nice tight moral. But in Brecht's plays, he used to do this thing where he would deny his audience catharsis so as to compel them to some moral or political action in the real world once they left the theater. And maybe that's an interesting idea. Like, what does denying catharsis mean in the metaverse? How do you compel people? It's really awesome. I'm going to build on it. I'll say that in all the definitions we've talked about, the audience is really important. So the notion that, you know, a game is something you play, but a metaverse is something society plays. Like it requires the complicit activity of lots of observers to decide that it's meaningful. Like the example I gave is football, soccer, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, why does soccer get front page news when a country wins? Why does it have its own dedicated section in many newspapers? And why is it something that is so important? Is it because soccer makes more money than Fortnite or more people play or it's been around for longer? None of those explanations are particularly satisfying. Those can all be causes. But I think the real reality is that sport is given a status in our society, like a special status, which is different from traditional entertainment and games. And that's always been true in the history of sport, like in its origins and in many societies where sport emerged. It's almost a sacred thing in some context. So that's a decision that requires all of us to go along with it, right? And I think the metaverse yep. is the same. It's not enough to have the infrastructure. It's not enough to have compelling experiences. It's not enough to have digital assets. You need the willing consent of a society to decide that these made up things have meaning and have value. And sure, when digital assets can make that easier, but you need that to exist. And that's why now as well, because people are ready to do that and they weren't ready to do that. Right. The internet was less mature. Well, I would even argue it's also the evolution of religion and society in that sense too. Yeah, great example. Like people don't have the same societal structures. I was thinking about this when watching a show that's super popular here in the US, which is so funny, which is Shit's Creek. And it's one of my all-time favorite shows. I watched it like 20 times during the pandemic. But it's interesting because I was thinking about the fact that like, it's what societies are, people crave, like the family unit in one, they're literally in two motel rooms. And part of that narrative makes people find meaning in adjacency to each other. Whereas in a sports game, people are finding shared meaning as strangers in an auditorium, for instance, or like watching on TV or online even, or Olympic sports, but they're still sharing meaning even if they're strangers and don't know each other. And obviously crypto can mediate that. So that's another thing. Religion in many ways is like a mass fiction or mythology or reality, however people want to perceive it, that people find and share meaning. But going back to this audience point that both of you are bringing up, Elena, you and the point of the Brechtian playwrights, and then Herman and the point that you're making that people have to be willing participants. I would add that even when you think about gaming, if you think about the differences between, you know, early procedural versus content-based games, there used to be this idea that a game had to have a very linear arc and completion and catharsis and resolution. And then this whole genre of like procedural games that literally have no narrative came up. But what's really fascinating now is we are now seeing games where they're very low fidelity. And this is also true in the crypto world with like examples like loot, where people are creating meaning bottom up. Like they're just taking these core artifacts and then they're creating meaning around it. And so I think this is really interesting because Sorry, just to close this thread, but this is like jamming a lot of thoughts for me too, which is I once edited this pioneer of like the sci-fi kind of futuristic magazine called Mondo 2000, this guy named Are You Serious? And he great, had... Oh, great magazine. Yeah. I can't believe that you referenced that just now. But anyway. Oh my God. I'm surprised you even know what it is because it's like before <laughs> everyone's time. <laughs> but I also edited Doug Rushkoff. And one of the pieces he wrote for me at Wired was on this idea of what he called narrative collapse. 
And it's this idea, kind of closing this thread, in this like Brechtian way where you don't give your audience catharsis because there isn't a linearity to narrative anymore. So think about the endless play of Game of Thrones. And so anyway, it's really funny and interesting to me because what kind of comes full circle here is a metaverse is a place where you need narrative, but the narrative can collapse and it's okay because you cannot have to have a linear story, which is actually what I think is so limiting about games as like a model for metaverses right now. Well, I think you're right in that for a metaverse to be valuable, a very wide range of things need to be able to happen. And who decides that they happen can't just be one narrator because it won't provide enough context for fulfilling experiences. I do think that you gain a kind of freedom, but you give up something as well. Because what happens in the metaverse to create value has to matter, has to change something and have a cost of some kind or be associated with something, it also has consequences. So in that example I gave of the 30,000 person stadium, if I sing and I have a beautiful voice and someone notices and it gets on YouTube and I become famous, you know, one of the things we noticed in our metaverse experiences versus our game customers' experiences is we get nervous inside our metaverse events. Performers and people who are there consistently behave differently in large-scale events than they do in other types of virtual environment because suddenly they feel like loads of people are there that are watching, that are paying attention, that are doing what they do. And I use the word in the book, ingenuity, which is if you want to be creative in the context of a reality shared by many narrators, you have to play by the rules of that reality. So you're free to you know, propose any change to the world, but it has to fit with the previous history of the world. And that's form of creativity that's a lot more technical, right? Oh, it's not just technical. It's actually creative because one of the rules of thumb for world building as a narrator content side is that you can break all kinds of rules, but they have to be within whatever the rules of that universe are. Or even like if you think about on-chain gaming and what's possible and things like Dark Forest and physics of games, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Oh, yeah. Dark Forest would be another interesting example of composability or extensibility in games. So Dark Forest is an on-chain game on Ethereum. And what's interesting about Dark Forest is it is one of the first on-chain strategy games. And it uses zero-knowledge proofs to obscure where a player is. So when you look at Dark Forest or when you join Dark Forest, basically what you see is a map and the map gradually gets sort of explored. And so you uncover kind of this fog of darkness and the map of this solar system gets larger and larger and larger and larger. And uncovering the map requires you to actually output hash power to mine coordinates. And so In the process of playing this game, you are discovering other planets, you're discovering other players' planets, and you sort of like wage this intergalactic battle in order to conquer other people's planets. And by the way, this is funny because Herman ends his book on the analogy of the Fermi paradox. So it's like obviously very connected, but keep going. (laughs) Yes, 100%. I feel (laughs) like intellectually, it's very, very related. And what's very cool is because the game is entirely on chain, all these other players, most of them are very technical developers, were able to create plugins and create alternative clients for the game. So players created marketplaces, players created this tool that automatically scheduled their moves. This is one of my favorite examples. Somebody actually outsourced compute to AWS to mine and uncover planets at a faster rate than other players. So this player had been playing for like 24 hours, but had uncovered way, way more of the maps than other people who have been playing for like several days. Somebody was like, yo, like, how did you do that? And he was like, oh, I'm running on a multi-cored AWS machine. I have 96 cores running. Sorry, I am running my own client and playing at a far more advanced level than all of you. And so it's this interesting example of players all agreeing over this canonical game, what the rules are, what the goals are, But even within those parameters, you can create a much, much richer experience. Another example, actually, that I really like is somebody created a way for you to sell planet coordinates that were hidden to other players, but known by you. So basically, 
in the game, information became an asset. Information about other people's planets became an asset itself. And so it's this idea that even if the world itself visually is very low fidelity or might have a very simple set of rules and parameters, if you get enough buy-in and enough people paying attention to you and playing your game, you can create this incredibly rich marketplace and just set of plugins and alternate experiences around the core game. It's really, really interesting when you describe it like that because it reminds me a little bit of the challenge of creating a minimal viable product in the early internet era where bandwidth was low, no one really could build sophisticated things. And it's interesting that one of the first and obviously very famous things sold online was books, right? Because it made sense to buy books since there was a very high amount of choice and a really bad internet experience. You know, remember the whiny modem noises, the cost, the scale? It was worth it because you could get that obscure physics book that you wouldn't otherwise get. I mean, that was my first experience of why I would buy something online. And obviously, you know, (laughs) nobody needs to highlight why that was a good strategy for Amazon. I think with the metaverse, it's the same. Like by focusing so much on experiences that are 10 years out involving VR headsets or something else, we don't ask the question, Mm -hmm. what exactly is it that's valuable now? Yes. When you describe that game stripped to its essential components, you can see that like just a large crowd interacting with a celebrity with their own voices in one spot, even if the graphics are awful, that feels extremely valuable to a lot of people. I think we forget just the gulf between the haves and the have nots of experience. We're very fortunate. You know, we both get the chance to meet important people, brands and groups and to have our opinion heard by them. For the vast majority of people, they will never get a chance to have Mick Jagger hear their voice. And the metaverse could be the first place where that's reasonably possible and could happen regularly. Yeah, and that was actually even, if you think about the early premise of Twitter, that was the most powerful thing, which is such a simple platform. And all it did as a child, you know, you had to write letters to your favorite authors and now you can reply them and sometimes get responses within seconds. That was such a game changer. I think people often take that for granted. Yeah, and you can have immense complexity emerge in such systems. Although the feature ends up being simple, its use becomes incredibly complex. You know, it's these little jumps that... If you follow a road focused on experiences, meaning value creation and to Elena's habitat reference in my book, but also this game, focus on presence, not immersion. You open this wild new world of possibilities, just like that game example that you gave, which is stripped down. Yeah. I think if you go down the road of immersion, you're forced to take more and more control away from the user to keep immersion at a high quality, right? If anybody could just act in Avatar, it would be a pretty crappy movie. But that of us, everybody's acting, everybody's interacting. And a lot of their contributions are not going to be of a high quality. So you have to think about what restrictions in immersion you will need in order to make the world make sense. This is why Minecraft is so graphically simple, because the reality is most people could not build content for a more complex environment, probably wouldn't want to. Minecraft wouldn't be better if it suddenly became octagons or some sort of solid tessellating space, whatever. You know, it would just be more complicated for most people, even if it was more expressive. I love that. This is a perfect segue. So on this degree of immersion, so you actually answered one of the debates I had, what is the degree of immersion required or not required for a metaverse? And Herman, I think you actually just answer that. But just to kind of put a fine point on this, earlier, you didn't actually close the bottom line for why VR wasn't a metaverse to you. I mean, is this connected to this point of degree of immersion and cause and effect? Can you just quickly close that thread for us? Conflating the two is great for Facebook's attempt at becoming the most relevant company in this space. It's pretty confusing for a lot of companies and brands that are like, well, is this about VR or not? VR is one of many ways of experiencing things. The metaverse is not specifically about the fact that you're experiencing new things. It's about the fact that you're experiencing those things in a context which allows you to create and trade meaning in a network. The meta element, it's the linking of those things together. So there are a lot of experiences that you can have in VR that are not suitable to be part of a metaverse. Mm -hmm. There are also a lot of experiences that are going to be important to a metaverse that have nothing to do with being in VR. I think the second debate you mentioned, which was what degree of immersion is required, we're incredibly good at immersion. I imagine a lemon, just like a fresh lemon and the taste of a lemon. I bet you immediately, like some people will start salivating right away just in thinking about, yeah, I just did, right? So like, it's funny because our brains are really, really good at making up things and experiences. Imagine how getting immersed in a novel, your brain is already fantastic at this, right? So immersion isn't that important. What's important is giving people new ways to be expressive. And so if you have to make the experience more immersive, because without that, people can't be more expressive. So for example, you need better graphics because because people want to express themselves, how they're feeling. You want their bodies to come across better or you want to improve the audio so that their voices can work better. Then great, because you're not just making the world more immersive. You're using that immersion to enable new modes of interaction. 
And I right. think when you prioritize immersion above presence, you start to create pretty but very empty worlds. Imagine how boring it would be if life actually was a movie. You couldn't make any choices except what to watch. That's what ends up happening if you just go down the road of high fidelity graphics and no creativity. I think funnily, degree of immersion always gets augmented or always feels more substantial the moment you bring in the physical world. So things in the digital world become more consequential when you know that maybe you're generating large volumes of ETH in the smart contract that you just shipped or in this NFT series that you've launched. But if that has gravity outside, there is a feedback loop between the physical world and the digital one. And that for me is very crucial where the experience is just contiguous between both. I agree that it would be amazing if it can be, but I think what's most important is Mm -hmm. that value can be easily transferred from the real world to the metaverse. So this is where middlemen set up tools in the places where value Mm -hmm. leaves their world and they make it really hard for value to leave their world. And they intentionally do that because their entire business model is based on gatekeeping some small subset of our lives. And that's really antithetical to how value gets created in the metaverse. So you really do need new business models. If your business model was, these are my users and you can't have them, like most games companies have, how is that going to work in a metaverse of seamless businesses and relationships? Like, you think Call of Duty is going to be okay letting its users go into Battlefield? No way, right? They're going to want controls and protection. So the metaverse forces companies to come up with business models that don't rely on owning the user or on captive, controlled, unnecessarily toll-filled platforms. It forces them to create genuine value through, for example, digital land, digital assets, or tokens. These things can be a lot more pro-user in the way they help companies monetize, I think. Oh, I mean, in the most obvious way, which is you have to work harder to retain your users because you're not relying on lazy business models that are literally taking the data exhaust of their lives versus actually creating and serving things or letting them create and serve things in cause and effect with each other as they kind of interact in the worlds. So I totally agree with that. Like it really prioritizes and puts the user at center. Okay, we talk about the creator economy on this show. In your book, you brought up the point of the value inversion that happens in the pyramid where right now the value at the top, the creators are a tiny part at the top of the pyramid and you want to invert that so that the creators are like the base. Elena, I want to hear your quick take on, on the why now. Yeah, I think the why now is the recognition that there needs to be a way for creatives and game makers and just anybody who wants to, to make a living on the internet. But the platforms that exist today aren't as hospitable to that as they should be. And so let's say you're a creator on Minecraft and you're selling a digital good and you're paying some kind of take rate both to the platform and then that platform is paying a take rate to the Apple App Store or some other platform that it lives on top of. In crypto, you don't have any middlemen. Or if you do have middlemen, they're taking a much smaller take rate. Let's say they're a marketplace taking a 2.5% take rate. So last year, Minecraft announced that they paid out $350 million to developers. So creators generated $350 million from mods on Minecraft. But after a 50% take rate, that's $170 million in creator payouts. And Minecraft has 140 million monthly active users. So if you think about the value that's being created on a platform like Minecraft versus what Minecraft and Microsoft is taking versus, you know, the amount of people who are actually enjoying and creating experiences on the platform, it feels very disjointed. And on the one hand, you have closed games platforms being a very poor place to make money as a games creator. On the other hand, you have these massive communities that could make a lot of money, but don't because they don't have interactive experiences. If you're a massive brand or a huge company or a sports league who is happy to make a massive investment in their community, you are actually monetizing your community really, really poorly. So, you know, FC Barcelona, they have something like half a billion fans. And I believe it's estimated that they make maybe a billion dollars a year from those half a billion fans. And that's a pitiful level of monetization relative to their potential brand power. And I think that creates this real opportunity for much less expensive and controlling platforms or pseudo platforms, probably rooted in Web3, probably providing new experiences and focused on monetizing that under monetized user base. But actually, one other thing to bear in mind is the current economic model of games involves free labor done by players 
to make games valuable. The reason games are free to play, it's not only because it's a more efficient way of getting money out of you. It's also because that makes the matchmaking queue as large as possible. So most players can find someone to play. Given that only a tiny fraction of people actually buy anything in a free-to-play game, 90% of the revenue is coming from a tiny fraction of people. And everyone else is actually in a job, a job they do for free, which is being shot by people who have paid money for items. When you put it like that, it sounds pretty dystopian. And so when we start talking about play to earn, we're not talking about some like, you know, pyramid scheme, multi-level marketing thing. We're just talking about the labor people are already doing in virtual experiences. And if you reward them, we'll encourage more labor. And if you get more labor and you get more people doing more energy inputting work into a virtual yes, world, it yes. so becomes more interesting. So of course we need virtual work if we want interesting virtual worlds. So the next quick debate I want to check in on is scale. So one theme that came up, you talked about this earlier, One of the points you make in your book, and it's funny because you defined metaverse earlier, you know, you describe all these qualities of networks of meaning, exchange of value. You didn't actually say at scale, which is like the other part that seems like a through line in your book, especially because, and this is something I don't know if people who are longtime listeners of the original A6 and Z podcast, which I show around for almost a decade, you came on twice. And the first time was like Tim Schafer and talking about, you know, gaming and all that. But you came on a second time to talk all about simulation and how the cool stuff only happens at scale. In your book, you make an argument that like, why are we sort of sharding things? You were taking the analogy of sharding and describing how communities and groups are essentially sharded and that we should be able to have some sort of intimacy at scale. I'd love to hear your case for that really quick. I mean, look, I can give a simple example. So let's say that me and Elena are both famous rock stars and we have done an event, which is true, by the way, for those yeah. that are listening that don't know, both of we us. have albums out. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but we... You and Elena? No, no, we don't. But let's pretend that we were. Let's pretend that we were. Um, let's just, no, I, you I, guys I, are rock stars. Though. No, no, no. I, I, I took going. everybody. No, but let's pretend that we were rock stars. And I was doing a concert in the metaverse last night with you know 50,000 very close fan members that were all together. And Elena suddenly showed up and announced in that moment that her and me were collaborating on a new song. We performed it live. We started hanging out with the crowd and engaging with them. And the next day, you know, someone asks you, because you're a huge fan of Elena's music. Someone goes, oh, were you there? You can't say yes to that if there were 20,000 copies of that world, like the Travis Scott concert. And, you know, Travis Scott wasn't there. Everything was pre-recorded. You couldn't influence it in any way. I was there is meaningless in that context. I was there has a very important social function in our society. We forget just how important, how much we value each other based on what we've done, where we've been, what we've seen, who we know. For the metaverse to add to that vital tapestry of value in our society, of course you can't shot it, right? You can shot a video game. Like who cares if you are in the same lobby as me in Call of Duty or not? Like it's fun if we're friends who are playing together, but I can equally have fun even if there's a group of 10 people who are completely randomly chosen. In fact, it might be better because you want me to win about 70% of the time so that I keep playing. So it makes sense that this is kind of anonymous. Nothing makes sense at all if we're talking about were you there? Were you at that experience? Mm, Did you contribute to be part of that? That is the fundamental reason, among many others, why I think the video game industry and the metaverse have the same relationship that theater does to television or movies. Which is? Well, I mean, if we take TV and movies and television, they all involve scripts, they all involve actors, they all involve people and audience. So on the surface, you'd think they'd have the same business, but they're completely different businesses. The business of theater and the business of TV and the business of film use similar words. They have productions and things like that. But, you know, one makes money through limited time ticket sales of physical experiences. The other one selling ads, the third one selling tickets. So when you look at it that way, you realize the metaverse is a very different business to the gaming business. It organizes its users, its content creators, and its value creation in a different way. And it needs different sorts of services and systems to support it. Elena, I want to hear your thoughts on this idea of sharding communities and more. Well, I have a couple of responses. I think in the case of really early DAOs, maybe they don't have a huge number of members. What they do have is a huge number of derivative projects. So there are people getting in at lower price points. And what they're enthused by is this idea of a community-owned treasury. And I think we will get to a point where people will want that to be physically embodied because quite frankly, it's chaotic to reconcile between different discords and discourse and all the different forums and, you know, Figma of your sharing designs that you have, things like that. Like you actually will need a physically embodied and organized kind of town square in order to make something. That agrees like with what that. Herman's saying in that sense. Yeah, we have to do our company 
many town halls in a massive collective space because it turns out that's the only way to make that make sense. You can't do it on Slack or Zoom when you have that many people. Yeah, exactly. And I do think what I would love to see is some way to chart continuity of conversations, kind of like chart intellectual thought. What blockchains do a great job of is charting financial value and charting ownership. What it doesn't do a great job of is how conversations weave into each other, where ideas actually came from. If somebody is proposing something on discourse and it gets a lot of chatter and then they rewrite the proposal and then the proposal is fulfilled and then they get X amount of ETH to do a Nouns DAO apparel line, Maybe you can see the outcome of that via a transaction, but unless you go through and understand all of the conversations that led to that outcome, it's actually very, very difficult to get a real sense of what actually went on. And so I think physically embodied space plays a huge role in terms of just like allowing people to tell stories and narrative in a robust way and actually be able to share and express history. That's fantastic. It's how our brains are designed, right? There's a fantastic book called The Art of Memory, which I can't recommend enough. But if people are familiar with the memory technique, where you kind of imagine your house and you remember things by remembering crazy characters stationed around your house or around your route to work or wherever that represent the things you're trying to remember. The reason that works so extraordinarily well, like it works so well that people with no special genetics, but just for training, have used it to learn 80,000 words and their placement in a dictionary and what page they're on. And it works really, really well because words and numbers are hacks onto a system that was more built around embodied experiences, on remembering where you've been, on where something is relative to you, on your orientation around it. Like, this is such a powerful concept that it was used in ancient Rome all the time. And in fact, even some buildings in the art of memory, the author argued that some buildings were actually probably designed to better support mind palaces because it was such a common practice. Mm, so, so amazing. This is how we work. So of course, embodied spaces, countering what I said earlier about, okay, it's not the center of the metaverse. No, it's not the center of the metaverse, but it's of course vitally important to making a lot of things make sense. I mean, a virtual company with no office, no opportunity for people to communicate, meet, interact, you know, it doesn't really leave a lot of mental room for even imagining the structure you're part of. A virtual office might serve two purposes. It might be a useful place for people to hang out and interact together and do awesome stuff. It might actually just be a great physicalization of what that company is in the future when people are in time mm -hmm. of remote working and giving people like a symbol or an item or something to kind of understand and to lock in, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. I had another thing that I wanted to respond to before about this idea of real time and the difference between a Travis Scott concert, which is sharded across multiple servers yes. and also just recording, whereas in other experiences is this idea of things happening in real time. I think it's fascinating that one of the biggest problems plaguing blockchains is this idea of time. What's an ideal block time? How do you decide how to reach finality? Yeah. How do you decide how to reach consensus? Like those are all really crucial questions of time. And I also think that we've reached this stage where whether something is IRL, whether something is in real life or digital is less important now. The more interesting question now is, is this unfolding in real time or is this a recorded experience? And I think the more meaningful digital experiences are the ones that unfold in real time. I'd go further and say, if you couldn't affect the outcome, did it actually happen? Like, was it already predetermined? So what people want rooted in self-determination theory and psychology, which is our best model today, and I talk about this in the book, for why people do the things they do when they're given a free choice. People want to create effects in the world. It's a fundamental human need to change something and have that change reflected back to you. And if you take away people's ability to have impact, they get very unhappy. It even creates social unrest. You know, if people don't feel like participants in society, well, then why should they go along with it? So the metaverse opportunity is to provide even more context where people can have meaning. But for that to happen, they have to actually have a choice to be able to make it go well or go badly. And that's a step into greater risk. And if it isn't, it's probably highly sanitized in corporate and extremely repeatable and delivered in a recorded way. 
it's probably not very valuable in our framework of value that we've talked about in this conversation. That's so funny because on the note of when you just said, Herman, about you reminding us over and over again, this key distinction of cause and effect and the ability to exert some kind of change, influence, et cetera, not just passively consume. When Elena was talking about this notion of real time being important, my mind immediately went to the idea presented in science fiction all around time traveling. Oh, yeah. And to me, like a metaverse is a way to also not just change identities and have multiple identities, but also be able to travel across time, past, present, future, like people engaging with dead members of their family from the past or history or even, you know, I was always obsessed at Wired with this idea of like digital suicide, how you can like create an identity and abandon it. Well, on Instagram, people already do things like have Finstas, like they'll have multiple accounts. But it's interesting because your point that you have to have cause and effect goes back to this idea of why we wouldn't just ever have a passive metaverse where you just go like learn about history in the past. But it's also why time travel movies, to Elena's point around real time, are so popular because that's this idea that you can go back and change the future. You're completely right. And I would say that since our minds don't care whether an experience happens in the real world or it happens in another context. Like if I talk to someone's voice who I love on the phone and then I can feel a meaningful change. It's obviously better when they're in person, but it doesn't really make a difference to the idea of communicating yes. love to one another. Given that it doesn't matter to us, there are enormous advantages if people start consuming a lot of important experiences online. One of them is that they can revisit, reimagine, rehab those experiences. For example, the concert where me and Elena announced our collaboration, yeah. that you had to be there for. But the fact that it happened in that way means there'll be infinity footage of that event. So we can rerun it, we can run different camera angles, we can have different kinds of participants. And you know, imagine if hypothetically an important political campaign played out in the metaverse one day in the future, you know, did rallies, interacted, did those things. That's all part of this network. And to the extent that any of it happened on chain, it's like immutable history. My bigger point here is that society in far future becomes a lot more efficient when more experiences happen virtually. This is one of those things that science fiction, I think, has just got mathematically wrong. And I talk about this in the book, but in a time of like climate crisis and challenges like that, why are we talking about the metaverse? Well, because surely our goal is to give as many people on Earth as possible the opportunity to live, the opportunity to be healthy, and then to have meaningful experiences. If that's our goal, we're going to be much better at giving more people that opportunity if we do things virtually. It's going to make sport or culture or fashion far more accessible to billions of people. It's going to make many more people participants in society and potentially contributors and even owners of things that they wouldn't be able to contribute to our own. And that's why I think we have to get out of the sort of proverbial Silicon Valley mindset sometimes with the metaverse. It's so interesting to so many people who've never heard of it. That's fantastic. By the way, I was going to say, if you haven't read it already, you have to read in terms of science fiction that tells the story and does justice, the Three Body Problem trilogy. I and if you read it. it already, I love me it. Too. I love it. Love me it, love too. It. I don't like their answer to the family paradox. I don't like it, but I love the series. Me too. Well, I was going to say, what people don't know is a lesser known fourth book that was sanctioned by Xu Qin Lu or Lu Xu Qin, which is The Redemption of Time. It's like a fanfic that he said could be canonical. And it's by this author named Bao Xu. And it actually tells Yun Ting Min's story about what happened when he traveled with the Trisalorans. And it was him being, because remember, he's a disembodied character who doesn't have a body and is essentially living as like a brain in a vat. And it's kind of a great story because Redemption of Time actually gets to your point about like what science fiction gets wrong, but also that might be the one case that it gets it right. So if you haven't read it, you need to read that fourth book. I think it's so cool that you mentioned this because it also brings up the dangers of companies making business decisions based on science fiction novels, right? Wait, so I totally forgot to mention this when I talked about Dark Forest. The game was actually inspired by the Three Body Trilogy. Of course. I thought, oh, yeah. oh my God, yeah. Duh, of course. I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not to say companies making business decisions based off of sci-fi. I think that was more of like an intellectual inspiration or kind of like <laughs> yeah. a hat tip to rather than like actual recreation of. But yeah, no, just a fun detail that I totally forgot to mention before. That's really, really awesome. I mean, to double click on this for a second, because I think it's an important point. Companies are getting chief metaverse offices now. And I bet you what those chief metaverse offices are doing is reading Snow Crash and Ready Player One. And of course, consuming a lot of you know business information as well. But imagine if employees at NASA sat there watching Star Trek and not looking at that in the correct light, which is 
this is a really amazing visionary piece of science fiction about space travel and many other things. And I actually looked at it and thought that is what a spaceship might ever look like. A lot of the authors who've written these works, they were using them as plot devices, right? And also a lot of these things are dystopian. You know, they're designed to warn us off progress in science and technology in general, because they came from a period of time post-nuclear, uh, thinking about some of the 80s fiction, you know, they came at a period of time where we'd gone too far, right, in terms of science. So this right. task idea of fully embracing the machine was something worth building up and bringing down. That's not really all that relevant to the metaverse as I see it, because I think it transcends technology. And that's why people should get away from the sci-fi and focus more on the real value proposition. And just to kind of come full circle and close all these threads, I don't know if you guys remember this post that the Kickstarter co-founder Yancy Strickler wrote in 2019 called The Dark Forest Theory of the Internet. And he basically argues in that post that, you know, we have this bifurcation or like multiple communities sharding across the internet and these conversations happening now in private channels like chat groups and discords and various things. And essentially that the internet is becoming a dark forest yeah. and for better and worse, like whether you want to connect with other groups, this goes to your point to networks of meaning and connection being critical, Herman, or whether you want to stay separate and undercover, as you were saying earlier with like the game, Elena. Yeah. So Herman, on that note, let's talk about your thesis that can unshard or like connect all this at scale. We'd love to hear you talk about like what's happening there. So Improbable has evolved a lot over the years. We used to talk a lot about our real-world simulation stuff. That's been continuing. We've been involved in mm -hmm. live military and other applications, problems relating to accuracy of simulations while still borrowing a lot of our distributed computing heritage. Meanwhile, we've also become the provider of multiplayer expertise to the games industry. As our business model evolved, we were inside so many different publishers. So now we need new experiences that are better than video games. It's probably going to support communities and companies that are underserved right now by video games. So hence sport, fashion, music, all of these areas. And where companies know that they can build businesses and not be beholden to another platform. What's so funny is we see a lot of debates about the metaverse. And for us, they're not debates because as a company serving enterprises, we can see what they're asking for. And it's mm -hmm. very interesting to me what they want. They all want largely the same thing. They want new ways of bringing large communities together instantaneously and cheaply with themselves, with mm -hmm. each other, with celebrities and experiences. And boy, do they want to sell digital assets. And so I think if your metaverse doesn't involve those two things, like you're going to invest in VR headsets or whatever, or smart TVs, it's hard to see how you're going to create new value. From a technology perspective, we handle not thousands of messages or operations per second, which is the most important metric in the metaverse. It represents how much information can be exchanged in a world. So how many players you can have, how much cool stuff can happen, how high fidelity it can be, how much interaction that can happen. So we've moved from doing not thousands like Fortnite or even millions like messaging services, but actually to billions of operations per second. And that technology is now so easy to operate that Really, every use case we've talked about here is viable. You could import assets from the blockchain, no problem. You could put, you know, 30,000 people now in a space with really any context you want. You could have that with an open SDK or API or even a whole world or platform that they own and operate. And with M squared, these individual platforms can be connected together, guaranteeing a degree of interoperability around avatars and digital assets, but also creating new opportunities for these companies to create shared value. I was wondering if you could talk about ops per second as a metric, it's really interesting. So I think it's important to move away from the specific implementation of today's technology to something more timeless, right? So I really mm -hmm. like simplifications that have helped us do that in the past. I like pixels, for example, because they are an implementation artifact of technology, but they're very easy for people to understand. More pixels, prettier graphics. I can show more detail on screen. You know, people get that. I think in the same way, people understand more bandwidth is good. You're going to be able to watch higher definition videos and stream them and interact with them. Okay. In the same way for the metaverse, the number to think about is this operations per second or messages per second. That's going to tell you how rich or interesting a world can ever be, whatever the designers do. And what we've seen in video games in general is that because they've only been able to handle a small number of messages a second, say 10,000, they have to shard. The reason Fortnite has 100 players and most people couldn't do more with Unreal Engine without serious optimization is because the game can only support so many messages on the back end. So, you know, to go from 100 players to 30,000 players, you don't multiply 10,000 by 30,000 times. You scale up way quicker. You get to billions and billions mm. of operations, right? So this problem becomes very hard to solve. It's a very non-parallel problem for the technical folks. And you end up having to design all sorts of systems to get around it. Just compressing bandwidth, just that one problem, compressing bandwidth down to an individual phone or PC. We've used machine learning to compress these updates 
to some ridiculous level of compression. It's to the point where we get to 350 kilobits per second for 10,000 plus people in a single space. I'd love to hear about how you're thinking about meaningful interaction in all of these worlds and what that really looks and feels like. I'm just curious kind of how you're thinking about the parameters around that, what you do want to permit, what you don't want to permit. What is meaningful interaction? What's a great, fantastic question. What's remarkable is how different it is from game design. So, you know, we're full of game developers and we've spent years building games, but all the instincts you have from game design are to control the experience and to make it repeatable and compelling. And those are not really relevant when you're dealing with a massive crowd of people, right? Like there's a massive crowd of people is like an animal. It's like a beast. It has its own energy and it goes in a particular direction. And we ended up architecting things so that everything was modifiable on the fly. The presenter or the actor can press a button and modify the world and have everyone else see the changes. That ended up being important because you don't know what the crowd is going to want to do that day or where things might go or flow to. The other thing that got really surprising is how much value you can create for people with just making them present. Like people seem to just Mm -hmm. enjoy Mm -hmm. being in a crowd. You know, in every experiment we've done, these crowds, they stay logged in for the entire event. They follow instructions. They really like reacting to... And I think that's such an important part of what it is to be human. And we've completely forgot about it in the way we think about our digital and online lives because it's just never been possible. A lot of large games companies now, they have an innovator's dilemma problem. All their revenue and value comes from these games. Unless they give up, not a little bit, not 10%, not 20%, not 50%, but the majority of that value to all of the people who will be creating worlds and content for their platform, there's just no economically interesting way for that to become better us. So we don't get to the metaverse unless we get to it stepping over in some ways the bodies of the legacy business models of Web2 companies. Like we don't get there unless we do that. You know, we're essentially in a dictatorship and we kind of have to overthrow this government if we want to have a free market economy. Yes. Look, I love everything about even the chaotic parts of Web3. I mean, I'm a programmer and this is full of all of the spirit of rebellion and disruption that the early internet had and early tech had. But I'm also conscious of the fact that it's possible to start reinventing the wheel in crypto because it becomes suddenly everything feels disrupted. But there's quite a lot we can borrow that already exists that we can use to help find solutions within the crypto space. So for example, the question, how does governance work when some people's opinion definitely matters more than other people's opinion in these systems? Maybe that was a bit off topic. No, I I totally agree with that. I think that is 100% on point, actually. I think if we return to the example of Nouns DAO or any DAO that's functioning today, be it in DeFi or in the realm of NFTs, you have this very, very robust, very, very engaged group of people who debate everything ranging from how to use the treasury to if you're a DeFi protocol, what your risk parameters should be around loans to even questions around more existential things like, do certain people hold too many votes? Do the people who control the protocol actually have the best interests of the protocol at heart? Things like that. And those are self-consensus and those get hashed out in forums or maybe on Telegram or Signal. And then you have questions of actual harder consensus and that's when votes are actually executed on chain or to bring that same example into the Ethereum development landscape, you can say soft consensus are all of the discussions that go around Ethereum improvement proposals and ETH research posts. And then hard consensus are things like when an EIP actually gets integrated into the protocol itself. To build on what Alina said, I'm thinking about what kind of governance you're going to apply to a metaverse world and talk about this one in the book. It's hard to see any answer except it's kind of like a country. Because you just get to a place where people become so invested in these experiences in these worlds, so much of their livelihood depends upon it. The idea of it being anything less than a government that they either elect or have some influence over, it's not going to create the right level of social legitimacy to the decisions that that entity is going to have to make. Yeah, I think what we're seeing especially with these experiments with governance on Ethereum is the early stages of creating what might be thought of as like a network state. Like how do you get consensus within a vast group of people who share a new currency and maybe a new set of values over how they want to live and what their society should look like and 
some of that society will exist digitally and some of that society will exist physically. And it's right now a question of, okay, how do you best facilitate that both in terms of encouraging meaningful interaction and how is that currency distributed? How is it earned? How easy is it for anybody within the community to have their voice heard? These are all really, really crucial questions just in terms of not just the evolution of the internet or the metaverse, but just human society in general. What you just said is so spot on because it kind of ties this thread. We have to remember both on this note of evolution that this is actually the next phase in our evolution as a species, like humanity, because we went from nomadic to like agrarian to city urban dwellers. We've gone to the internet, but we've never ever, and I think people forget this at the most basic level, coordinated it, this kind of unprecedented scale as humans online. And that enables new forms of coordination, collaboration, governance, as we've been talking about, incentive alignment, including strangers, which is actually really powerful if you think about it, because for most of human society, it's always been about people you know, whether it's in your local neighborhood, et cetera. I don't know if the network state or the nation state is still the right analogy. I don't know, because I almost think we might have to untether to something new and native to this new world. And I don't think we're anywhere near there. But like you said, Herman, we have a lot of room for taking what we've already learned, for instance, like open source community collaboration. That's the first example of strangers coordinating to build work in big ways on the internet. There's so much we can learn from existing things. And Elena, to your point, there's so much we can learn from what Ethereum and other communities are doing online. So I think that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. What is your prediction? Or Herman, you make a point in your book, which we wholeheartedly agree with, that you can never predict the form of the thing, but certainly the directionality of it. What do you see as coming next? Like a quick kind of 30 second answer without worrying about form or time scale. Elena, do you want to go first really quickly and then we'll have Herman close out? Yeah, I think sort of a continuation of what we're already seeing, which is these internet native communities rising up. They have a shared treasury. And I think what we'll soon see is a more physicalized and embodied form of that, both in the physical world and in the digital one as well. This is going to be everything now. I don't mean that hyperbolically. I mean that literally. Over enough of a time scale, more and more of what matters to people will happen inside virtual spaces and involve digital assets. I mean, you know, software ate the world. And I think the metaverse is going to eat not just this world, but our culture, our imagination, everything. Well, this is a fantastic note to end on. Elena and Herman, thank you so much for joining this week's episode of Web3 with A6 and Z. Thank you so much, Sonal. I have enjoyed this so much. Thank you for listening to Web3 with A6 and Z. You can find show notes with links to resources, books, or papers discussed, transcripts, and more at a 6 zcryptocom This episode was produced and edited by Sonal Choksi, that's me. The episode was technically edited by our audio editor, Justin Golden, with Seven Morris. Credit also to Moonshot Design for the art, and all thanks to support from a 6 and Z Crypto. To follow more of our work and get updates, resources from us, and from others, be sure to subscribe to our Web3 weekly newsletter. You can find it on our website at a6nzcrypto.com. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. Let's go. Let's go.